Welcome to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality's webinar on leveraging digital health technologies to address the needs of underserved populations. Although a few people are still logging in, we're going to get started on time. My name is Chris Dimmick, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I currently serve as the director for ARC's Digital Healthcare Research Program, which is part of the Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement at ARC. Our program's mission is to produce and disseminate evidence about how the evolving digital healthcare ecosystem can best advance the quality, safety, and effectiveness of healthcare. To fulfill this mission, the program funds research that yields actionable findings around which digital healthcare technologies can improve care for our key stakeholders, patients, clinicians, and health systems. We'll discuss three of these exciting research projects during today's webinar. Next slide, please. The agenda for today's webinar is positioned here for you. Please note that we are recording this webinar and that the recording and slides will be available on the ARC Digital Healthcare Research website in a few weeks. You'll be notified by email once they're available. Next slide. We're pleased to have with us today an esteemed group of presenters. They include Dr. Andrea Wallace, Dr. Brian Jack, and Dr. Peter Yellowies. This webinar is accredited by Affinity CE. If you're interested in receiving continuing education credit for participating in this activity, information on how to claim your credit will be presented at the end of the presentations. It will also be emailed to you after this webinar. For the purposes of accreditation, let me note that ARC, SD Solutions, and Affinity CE have no financial interest to disclose. Doctors Wallace, Jack, and Yellowlees also have no relevant financial interest to disclose. Also, please note that no commercial support was received for the development of this learning activity. Next slide. Just a brief note about questions. We've reserved time at the end of the presentations to address participant questions. However, during the presentations, feel free to submit questions that you have for presenters using the Q&A panel located on the right side of the PowerPoint slides. Please include the presenter's name, or their presentation order number with your question. As a reminder, participants are in listen-only mode, so to ask questions, you'll need to use the Q&A panel. Next slide, please. This slide shows the learning objectives for today's webinar. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to first explain how using an electronic social needs screening tool in the emergency department can improve referrals for patients in need, and monitor population health post-discharge. Second, discuss how an innovative artificial intelligence communication system can identify and mitigate health risks for young African-American women prior to pregnancy, thereby reducing health disparities in birth outcomes. And third, describe the potential impact of telepsychiatry consultations with automated interpreting on mental health services for patients with limited English proficiency. Next slide. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Andrea Wallace. Dr. Wallace is an Associate Professor and Associate Dean for Research at the University of Utah College of Nursing. Her research focuses in designing healthcare service interventions aimed at narrowing gaps in clinical outcomes while simultaneously understanding how these interventions can be implemented during routine care or without research resources. Dr. Wallace regularly serves on federal review panels with a specific focus on social health integration and implementation science. Most recently, Dr. Wallace's ARC and National Institutes of Health funded research has focused on how to assess and act on the social risks and needs of patients and family caregivers during in-person in -person and emergency department discharge planning. And now I'd like to turn the control over to Dr. Wallace. Thank you. It's an honor to be with you all today to present this work. I sincerely hope this is helpful to anyone interested in implementing social needs screening and referrals in clinical settings. Nothing I present today is done without help from my research collaborators, community partners at Utah 211, and the U University of Utah staff. It's been very fortunate to receive funding from AHRQ and currently from NINR. I have no conflicts, financial or otherwise, to disclose. So first, I'd like to begin with the why of this work. So this is a map of urban Salt Lake City where the University of Utah is located. 
What this map illustrates is the 10 year difference in life expectancy between where I live in the university neighborhood and where I buy my coffee just down the hill in urban downtown. And we have important clues about the reasons for these health disparities. In fact, if you do a Google search for social determinants of health, you'll pull up many colorful wheels just like this, each with slightly different percentages. But the point here is there's overwhelming evidence of social circumstances. And here I'd argue that environment, behavior, and medical care, also byproducts of social circumstances, are responsible for the majority of health outcomes. Now, of course, biology and genetics are important. But the vast majority of health and thus health disparities are socially constructed phenomena. And also foundational to what I present today are three important definitions that are often used interchangeably but need more precision before I'm launching into the details of our work today. So we've likely all seen this definition of social determinants of health or SDOH or social drivers of health. But one very important nuance to realize is that social determinants are both positive and negative. We are all subject to social determinants. It's the social context in which we all live. The health of everyone listening today is subject to social determinants. A good example of a social determinant is social support. There are vast data showing the importance of social support and health outcomes, but depending on the circumstances, it can both positively or negatively impact health outcomes. In contrast to social determinants, social risk factors negatively affect health. An example I'd like to use is adverse childhood events, or ACEs. We know ACEs are associated with poor health outcomes, but at the level of it being a risk factor, we don't yet have actionable information when someone walks into our clinical settings with a high ACEs score. And social needs are our most tangible, more immediate, and ideally more actionable. They are the needs of an individual as a result of social determinants of health. There are many examples, but some include currently having money or transportation to get prescribed medications or utilities to keep the fridge running and the insulin good. So with this, the research I talk about today are, is about social needs. And this is the model we've worked with that recognizes that effectively addressing social needs in clinical settings requires, first, high quality accessible screening approaches that can take place in clinical workflow. Second, it requires means of effectively communicating the information to clinical teams in a way that informs clinical decision making. And third, requires effectively linking patients with resources that can meet their needs at home. We need to recognize that while we can start the process of understanding needs in clinical settings, addressing those needs requires commitments and connections far beyond screening during a clinical encounter. And because social determinants work has been moving fast in healthcare, colleagues at UCSF and their SIREN network assembled this report last summer to give us an update of social needs screening in the US. This is a very accessible report for those interested, but primary findings included that there is a ton of variability in terms of how screening is being implemented. And while patients and providers generally find the purpose of social needs screening acceptable, they have some serious concerns about privacy and a lack of resources with which to respond. And this is on a larger arena where health systems are responding to new regulations. CMS is mandating social needs to be assessed and acted upon as part of inpatient care. And health systems, because they know that responding will require linkages to community resources, are seeking ways to understand the outcomes of referring to systems outside of healthcare's EHRs. But this effort is bringing in competition from proprietary systems and raising questions about patient privacy in a landscape where state health information exchanges have had difficulty getting up and running. And in fact, there are state level efforts to adopt legisla legislation mandating patient consent before sharing social needs and outreach information back to health systems. So in that landscape, I place our UHealth research program. Our purpose since this work started in 2017 has been to develop means of ethically and effectively identifying social needs that can be used in routine care when the work isn't necessarily supported by dedicated research staff to facilitate access to community-based resources and integrate clinical and community-based data. To date, we've screened over 20,000 patients across multiple studies, and our work is grounded in a partnership with Utah 211, which is part of a national network of community service referral centers specializing in offering connections to free and low-cost community-based assistance programs for things like food and housing to all those who dial 211. And the overview of how we've done this is actually quite straightforward. 
using low cost, readily available HIPAA compliant tools, in this case, REDCap, available in most academic health centers, staff screen for patient social needs using what is now the validated 10 item sincere screener. The citation about the screener psychometrics is included here, and I'm happy to share it. We referred those who have needs and want outreach to a 211 resource specialist who aims to contact patients via phone, text, or email within 48 hours. And we compiled data from inside and outside the health system to understand needs and community outreach, outreach processes. Our partnership with Utah 211, which has robust encounter and resource databases, how to, has allowed us to do all this. And of course, this is displayed differently on the touchpads, but this gives a visual of what's administered. On the left are questions from the 10 item sincere screener, and on the right is information gathered from those who would like to be contacted by 2 and one for service connections after discharge. And we have gathered and continue to gather quantitative and qualitative information from patients, staff, and 2 one resource specialists to understand the challenges and implications of integrating social needs screening into clinical systems. So let's first talk about some numbers of what we've seen from this work. In our Digital Health R21 funded by ARC, we screened ED patients for social needs over 15 months and focused on evaluating our efforts using an implementation science approach. We followed the number of patients approached, completed screenings, positive screenings, and referrals from 211 to understand the potential population health impact. And here we show what might be expected if systems implement screening into routine care without dedicated staff and mandated screening. About 10% of potential ED discharges were approached by screening by staff, for screening rather, by staff. The good news is that the screening is relatively easy to complete. It takes about one minute and most finish the questions. Now for the other news. We saw and continue to see that over 40% of our patients screened in our university ED have one or more needs, but only 40% of them want outreach. Of those who want outreach, only 30% connect with 211 for help. In the end, that means less than 10% of those who state they have social needs actually engage in a way to get help. And here we see the breakdown of stated needs from the most to least common. In our psychometric analysis of the sincere screener, it's important to note that the four needs at the top for utilities, mortgage or rent, household items or food, drove patients' desire for outreach. Likewise, having two or more of any of the 10 needs listed also drove a desire for outreach. And here's just a sample of the data we track in terms of screening activity with staff. Even after the research study stopped, staff maintained screening and the health system saw the service as valuable. However, there was and continues to be a great amount of variability between individual staff in terms of engagement and screening. But this is why we continue doing this work. Here's one example of notes summarized from our 211 resource specialist. In her initial call, the resource specialist wrote, I spoke with patient's daughter who mentioned her mother needs help with meals and transportation to appointments when she's not available. I provided a list of resources and will follow up next week. And two weeks later, she wrote, I spoke with the patient. She mentioned she nor her husband speak English or drive. She's 83 years old and had heart surgery 17 days ago, has MS and arthritis. Her husband is 92, diabetic and on oxygen. She said her daughter helps, but is busy juggling school and work. Because of the busy schedule, her daughter wasn't able to connect any resources, connect with any resources. I was able to connect the patient with aging and adult services and help translate, as well as help complete the phone application for Meals on Wheels and Ride for Wellness program. Starting next week, patient and her husband will receive meals Monday through Friday and will receive services for transportation and medical appointments. This is why we do this work. So from the numbers, we can screen and make connections to a quick and cost-effective way with existing low-cost resources. But in routine care, we had lower than anticipated screening and we have clear drops, what we now call voltage drops, between those with needs and those who ultimately get help. So now, what did all the qualitative data from staff and patients tell us about where to go if we want screening needs, if we want social needs screening to be effective? Despite scripting and ongoing training in interviews and observation, we found a lot of discomfort from staff about asking what they viewed as stigmatizing questions. And we found that staff profiled patients. They would determine who to screen based on clothing, insurance, or listed employment. 
And without going into as much detail as the paper cited here, of course, we really found that self-determination theory applied well here. The staff who saw this as a tool for engaging with patients and felt that they had an important role in their larger clinical team were those who were more inclined to screen patients for social needs. Meanwhile, from patient focus groups, they understood that healthcare providers may not be able to address all their needs, and while they would prefer nurses to do the screening, they're open to screening being done by other team members as long as it's done with sincerity and is done universally. They don't want to be singled out and ask these questions. They also recommend that questions be accompanied with a clear explanation for why they're being asked even before they're asked. And something that we didn't fully expect, patients strongly communicated they do not want this information to be in their EHR for fear of being permanently labeled and treated differently by healthcare providers. They voiced serious concerns about their privacy and, and potential stigma. So as we continue exploring all these tools to make it easy to document in clinical settings, we need to better understand how to make these efforts patient-centered and reduce the risk of reinforcing health inequities. And we continue to do more work here. An example is that our data show that it seems important to focus on multiple needs versus one need, in this case, food insecurity. The analysis also demonstrated how screening data can be linked to community resources, in this case, food pantries throughout the state of Utah. And in this analysis, we show there are likely language-based differences in screening and referrals. In fact, this justifies our inclusion of a question, do not wish to respond option to each question as Spanish speakers while on average report more needs, are also less willing to disclose those needs. In our latest work, we've demonstrated how we, that how we do screening results in differences in desire for outreach. Unsurprisingly, those who interact electronically via MITRA are very different than those who screen while in the ED. So we need to carefully consider how and where we screen and how that may reinforce inequities. And finally, what these graphs show, which are under review now, is that having a personal phone number is important to receiving help, and that not having your own phone number is tied to needs for housing and transportation. These findings feel like common sense, but in this sample, 7% of our patients screened may have no way of communicating with the health system, even by phone, much less by text messages or through an EHR portal. So this is a cautionary tale about how patients continue to be left behind if we rely solely on EHR to do outreach. So then what are we doing now with this? With the launch of our latest study in November 2020, 2021, our screening takes place in the adult and pediatric emergency department's mobile health outreach clinic. And because of our NIH funding is in part funded by a COVID focused initiative after COVID testing. COVID tested patients are sent the sincere social needs screener via my chart message. This is in contrast to screening methods and all their sites, which is done in person by staff, research associates and volunteers. After screening, patients are asked whether they would like outreach by 2 on one resource specialist for free and low-cost referrals. The name, contact information, and social needs have been shared with 2 on one who attempt to contact patients within 48 hours of referral. To test whether we can improve outreach success, patients are randomized to one of three groups. To usual care involving multiple referrals and follow-up conducted only as needed, to attention control involving multiple referrals and follow-up every two weeks for three months, or to collaborative goal setting involving prioritization, troubleshooting, action planning, follow-up within 72 hours, and then every two weeks after three months, or for three months, rather. Patients with a two-on-one -on -one interaction are then asked if they wish to complete surveys to better understand community service use and to enroll in our ongoing study. And as you can see here, in addition to tracking outreach and connections made, a range of six-month general health and COVID-specific outcomes are then tracked for those who enroll in the study. So, in sum, our current work, we're focusing on expanding referrals to understand how to best reach those impacted by COVID-19 and now in general health populations. We are testing methods for improving engagement and connections centered on patient problem solving and self-efficacy. We're measuring patient-centered outcomes over time versus focusing exclusively on health service utilization. And along the way, we're targeting motivation and competence of staff engaged in screening. So I know this has been a lot to take in today and that this work has many components that are ongoing, but the key takeaways is we have readily available cost-effective tools to universally screen for social, uh, social needs in our healthcare systems. Our approach is one of many approaches that can be used, but our research findings uncovered some critical caveats that suggest that addressing social needs in clinical settings needs to consider staff and patient beliefs, relationships, and systematic barriers if it is to be a solution for addressing health inequities. 
Thank you for listening today. And again, we hope this gives attendees some useful information about screening to consider in their own work. And uh, of course, here's my email if you have any questions that don't get addressed today. And thanks again. So thank you very, very much, Dr. Wallace. As a reminder for the audience, we'll be taking questions after all presentations. So please submit any questions you have right now into uh, the Q&A panel. Let's move on to our second webinar presentation, which is being led by Dr. Brian Jack. Dr. Jack is a professor and former chair of the Department of Family Medicine, Boston University, University School, School of Medicine. His research team developed the re-engineered discharge program, now used in hospitals around the world. He has received the Peter Drucker Award for Nonprofit Innovation, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention External Partner of the Year Award, and the ARC Award for grantees whose work has led to significant changes in healthcare policy. He's also a member of the National Academy of Medicine. And now, allow me to turn the control over to Dr. Jack. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, very, very much. It's, a, it's really a pleasure to be here uh, with you today. Okay, so um, today I will discuss um, a health information technology system we designed over the past 10 years uh, to deliver preconception care for young African-American women using conversational agent technology. Um, it's been a long-going um, project uh, funded with six or seven different grants from different sources especially from ARC. We're greatly appreciative to them. Our motivation for this work uh, is, um, is shown here, and that there is an unacceptable disparity in maternal and child health outcomes between African-American and white women. As you can see, there's um, data for low birth weight, preterm birth, infant mortality, and maternal mortality rates by white women, Hispanic women, an African-American for each of those uh, birth outcomes. And you can see graphically that um, this is one of the most despicable disparities of them all, and that we have to do something about it, and we haven't done nearly enough to do that. Okay. Um, and we have taken a primary prevention approach uh, to improving birth outcomes for African-American women, that is, to identify health risks prior to pregnancy, introduce interventions to mitigate those risks. Um, as the CDC uh, has defined, preconception care is the medical care of a woman or a man who receives uh, that focuses on parts of health that have been shown to increase the chance of having a healthy baby. And risks um, are very, very common. And you can see here that the, the percent uh, prior to pregnancy who uh, smoke, who consume alcohol, previous medical conditions, seronegative, HIV, AIDS, prenatal care, various medical comorbidities, um, ter taking teratogenic drugs, uh, overweight or obese, not taking folic acid, uh, is really profound. And to identify these risks prior to pregnancy um, um, makes a lot more sense than identifying these risks um, at the beginning of pregnancy so that something can be done prior to pregnancy to improve outcomes. So there is a need um, to uh, a need for efficient ways to assess a woman's preconception risks in order to prioritize valuable appointment time with providers and to support the woman in taking action to minimize her risks. Um, as part of the work of the CDC Select Panel on the Content of Preconception Care, the clinical work group that I chaired identified over 100 clinical conditions which, if identified and addressed before pregnancy, could improve pregnancy outcomes. This work was published as 13 articles in the American Journal of OBGYN that correspond to the domains and individual, individual risks that are shown here. The GABI system that we're going to talk about in a minute um, identifies each of these domains and each of these individual risks in a risk assessment tool uh, that was developed as part of this work. So the question is, can health information technology help to screen for and to identify preconception risks and to provide interventions appropriate for each of those risks? So we have worked uh, to develop GABI with my colleague Tim Bickmore, uh, who really was a, a, one of the 
moving forces in conversational agent technology over the past 15 years, who's now at Northeastern University. So Gabby is an animated conversational agent uh, with tailored dialogue, tailored meaning specific to the individual risks for that woman uh, and the ongoing unfolding dialogue that Gabby presents uh, about that risk. Um, the uh, Gabby screens for over 100 preconception risks, provides 12 months of evidence-based health education tailored to a woman's individual risks provides behavioral change counseling based on what the patient is ready for, and measures progress and provides feedback about those risks uh, over 12 months. We did a great deal of um, qualitative research and, um, and research to identify what um, the character really ought to look like using focus groups, key informant interviews, uh, patient advisory groups, uh, and usability testing conducted with over 100 African-American women uh, ages 15 to 34, which is our target group um, over the past 10 years. And using this information um, with suggestions for a design of what the, uh, what the character's name is, what the character looks like, uh, what the script content is, uh, what are the backstories of the character and stories that the character tells in the unfolding dialogue, uh, various social networking the tools that we have implemented and the visual layout of what the um, interface looks like. A typical Gabby uh, system interaction uh, looks like this. So the patient will meet Gabby, take the health survey to identify which of those 100 things are worth um, talking about, which are the patients is, is at risk for, screens positive for. Gabby then reviews what we call the My Health To-Do List, which is the list of things that um, that uh, the woman, upon her choice, can decide what to address and what not to address, and can choose the topic to learn about uh, with Gabby. Um, and Gabby doesn't force anything on them, but they can choose uh, when they're ready to talk about uh, each of the individual risks. Identify the trans-theoretical model stage of change. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Uh, to identify whether or not they're pre-contemplative, in which case they will receive motivational interviewing dialogue or they're contemplative, in which case they'll receive shared decision-making dialogue, or if they're the action and maintenance phase, in which case they'll receive problem-solving tips, homework, and goal-setting. The user then decides to learn more about that topic. Gabby provides up to 12 months of, of health education dialogue and then achieve the goal. And the goal that we have achieved is reaching action or maintenance in the trans-theoretical model for the, re the randomized trial that we'll talk about in a moment. If they achieve the goal or if they decide to move on to learn about a different risk, then they go back and choose from the other list of risks that were identified on the risk assessment. The Gabby um, also organizes the risks identified so that the user can keep track of their progress. Um, and there are features uh, such as um, the Gabby blog, glossary, uh, health websites that they can identify. They can browse various health topics. There's a personalized color scheme and quotes. They can, they can produce their own personalized reproductive life plan about what their goals are relative to reproduction and set their own goals. In, in, in addition to identifying the risks in terms of living well and staying well that have been identified and tracking them over time so the woman can keep track uh, of how well she is progressing through the list of risks in terms of um, resolving them or mitigating them. The trans-theoretical model uh, was the outcome of our randomized control trial, and it, it is pre-contemplation, which is not intending to take action in the next six months, contemplation, intending to take action in the next six months, preparation or planning, ready to take action next six months, having made lifestyle changes in the last six months, or doing uh, a new behavior for six months, which is maintenance. So that, so that behavior change is a process, not an event and breaking down into the various uh, levels of the trans-theoretical model has been very useful for us. I just want to show quickly um, what a typical uh, interaction could look like, uh, showing Gabby providing motivational interviewing uh, for a woman. Specifically, this conversation is tailored uh, in the dialogue for uh, a woman who is sexually active, not desiring pregnancy, and not using birth control. So, so she's pre-contemplation, 
free contemplative for not using birth control because she's sexually active and not desiring pregnancy, but not using birth control. So this is what Gabby would do. The first step to good preconception health is being able to control when you get pregnant. Is it okay if we talk for a few minutes about planning ahead for pregnancy? I understand that this can be hard to talk about, and it is up to you. But this is a topic that women often feel torn about and sometimes it can be helpful to talk about it. It will only take a few minutes. How would you feel if you got pregnant right now? I understand that you probably have a lot of other things going on, so thinking about pregnancy might not be at the top of your list. But, if you could choose to be pregnant right now or not, what would you prefer? It sounds like you have some concerns about getting pregnant. Could you tell me more about that? So it sounds like you're concerned that a baby would get in the way of doing things you want to do, but you mentioned earlier that you are not using birth control regularly. Can you tell me more about that? Tell me more. Why do you think you cannot get pregnant? It is true that an irregular period, or a period that does not come at all, could make it harder for you to get pregnant. But it does not make it impossible. Your body could release an egg at any time, and that means if you have sex, you could get pregnant. And did you know that half of all pregnancies are surprises? Many of those are to women who did not think they could get pregnant. And you have said that you do not want to be pregnant right now. How about if we talk about some effective ways to prevent pregnancy? Sure, so, so the woman responds, sure. So in this short conversation, the woman has gone from pre-contemplation, meaning that she did not want to talk about family planning methods to prevent pregnancy, uh, in a short conversation saying, sure, let's talk about that. So I'm going from pre-contemplation to contemplation. When the system was developed, uh, we conducted a randomized control trial that was published in the Lancet Digital Health a year or so ago. Um, the, we randomized um, 528 African-American women uh, from around the United States uh, enrolled online uh, who self-identified as African-American or black were women ages 18 to 39, not pregnant, and had telephone or computer internet access. The control group uh, received a letter listing the risks, so they had the same risk assessment, the risks were identified, and they were told to speak with their doctor or clinician about uh, addressing those risks. Uh, or the intervention group, which is Gabby, uh, who intervened on uh, all the risks for a period of 12 months. The primary outcome was reaching action or maintenance, meaning it was resolved or a problem that had been addressed and resolved uh, at the, uh, at the, during the intervention period. Uh, our outcomes show that we recruited, we were successful in recruiting 528 African-American black women from across the U.S. from 35 states and 242 different cities. Uh, characteristics of the samples showed that we uh, recruited uh, women with higher levels of education, computer literacy, and higher health literacy um, than was expected. Uh, we used Gabby, use of Gabby resulted in a 16% increase in the reported rate of uh, primary care risks being addressed compared to the control and reaching action or maintenance. And the data is here for six months um, and here for 12 months. So at 12 months, the 16% increase uh, had maintained itself over the 12-month period in terms of maintaining uh, the uh, success that they had uh, in resolving risks. 
After six months, two thirds of the participants report they used information from Gabby to improve their health. Another 20% plan to in the future. Now, looking at the data specifically by health domain, uh, what we can see if we look at nutrition, for example, so this is where people start, both in the blue is the intervention group, the red is the control group. You can see the intervention group moves further along on average for women who have uh, risks in those areas. All the domains made progress except for substance abuse, which did not make progress. And overall, the domains literally moved from contemplation to preparation uh, on average um, across all risks. Participants told us the nurse or doctor, they tell you, uh, but like how they say it. They say it in different ways. But how Gabby said it, she actually said something that I actually understood. Hmm, it's like it seems like she's not going to judge you if like there are things you did or something. Sometimes the doctor is really busy. They might not have the time to answer or the patience to talk with you about those issues. So in that way, Gabby is better. You know, with those uh, outcomes, uh, we have adapted uh, the Gabby system for use in the low middle income country in Southern Africa of Lesotho, which has high HIV and TB rates. We culturally adapted the system, clinically adapted it, and technologically adapted to use cell, cell phones, mobile phones, uh, in, in Lesotho. Uh, the idea there is that we can assist overworked health workforce to deliver health education. On the left, you can see a picture, a real picture, from a typical day in the outpatient department with this long, long, long lines of patients who need to be seen, uh, where there's enormous amounts of health workforce um, need in the SUTU. And that we've, we've, I think, begun the journey to leapfrog from the idea of delivering face-to-face -face health education in a situation like this in OPD is really not going to happen. But the leapfrog right to health education on mobile phones uh, in Lesotho is a real possibility um, in the future. Our early data show uh, that, that uh, women who have used the system for, um, I guess it's four to six weeks, uh, in terms of it helped me make decisions, it could it could quickly improve health education in Lesotho. I intend to continue using it. I want to encourage others to use it. It's culturally appropriate. It's kind of off the scale in terms of uh, agreeing or strongly agreeing with those statements. We, all, all, we have also now uh, begun to develop Gabe, another conversational agent character for young men, young African-American men specifically. The content, though, is really very different. It does include medical conditions and risks, but much more on emotional health, on nutrition, sleep, exercise, housing, employment, education, and a lot of the social determinants, criminal justice, healthy relationships, discrimination and resilience, family planning, and adverse childhood events, et cetera. So in conclusion, uh, we believe that uh, Gabby is an advanced, comprehensive, and tested patient-facing health IT system that is widely scalable, tailoring uh, and, and engagement in health behavior change dialogue are game changers. And it can be used as an adjunct to clinical care, that is to assist a clinician in the office to deliver health education on these things and to, and to monitor progress that Gabby makes, or as a population health too at the health system level, uh, and can, we believe, be used in under-resourced settings within the world. It's clear that young consumers want to use these new technologies. And now the emphasis on our system and in our work uh, is on implementation of the system. So uh, thank you very much. It's really been a pleasure. And uh, we hope that there's time for questions at the end. So thank you so much, Dr. Jack. And for our audience, again, please feel free to submit any questions you have using the Q&A panel at this time. So let's move on now to our final presentation of this webinar of this webinar, which is being led by Dr. Peter Yellowlees. Dr. Yellowlees is the Distinguished Emeritus Professor of Psychiatry at the University of California, Davis, where he directs the Fellowship Program in Clinician Wellbeing. He is also CEO of Async Health Incorporated, a telemedicine company he co-founded. He has written over 250 academic papers and book chapters and seven books, as well as over 180 video editorials on psychiatry for Medscape. He is regularly invited to present lectures nationally and internationally, and is often featured in the media. And now I'd like to turn the control over to Dr. Yellowies. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. It's a real pleasure to be here, and, and thanks to everyone who's logged in and who's listening. Uh, the, um, 
I want, I'm going to start with a little bit of context. Um, I'm talking about uh, automated interpretation of language uh, in both medical and psychiatric consultations today, and I'm going to really review just how accurate are some of these systems that we've been using here at UC Davis. But this all goes back about 20 years when we first started uh, seeing patients in the Central Valley of California uh, using uh, video conferencing, so ordinary telepsychiatry. Um, and we found that whilst we saw many patients without any problems, the um, Hispanic typical field worker population were actually very difficult to reach. They uh, frequently had uh, poor English, uh, and uh, so we, we had to use interpreters. Uh, at this time, interpreters were not readily available. And, and, they, and generally, these interpreters were either family members, often children, um, or uh, some of the nursing staff in the clinics. But either way, they weren't very satisfactory. The alternative was that the patients just simply didn't turn up uh, for their psychiatric assessments. Um, and that's because they couldn't afford to take uh, a half day off from work um, to come and have an extra medical consultation. So we started uh, the process of asynchronous telepsychiatry at that stage, where we started literally recording videos of the patients rather than when they came in to see their primary care physician. And that saved them a full day off work uh, to have an extra consultation. We then sent those uh, video recordings to our psychiatrists uh, who looked at them, uh, reviewed the electronic records and wrote consultation notes that the primary care physicians could follow up with the patients. Um, now, having been doing that for a number of years, uh, we thought that it might be interesting to see if we could use the asynchronous nature of the internet to add value to those consultations. In other words, we could do the consultations in the patient's own language, uh, typically Spanish, um, and then uh, have those uh, Spanish uh, uh, videos uh, automatically interpreted using a number of different interpreting tools that were becoming available about uh, a decade ago. And that led us uh, to, uh, to, to applying to ARC for this particular grant. Uh, now, if I move on. Um, so what was the aim of this grant? Uh, first of all, we wanted to build an automated asynchronous interpretation tool. And we did that in the first year. We wanted then to take that tool to compare the interview and language interpretation quality and accuracy of automated translation compared with our gold standard of interpreted translation. The next aim was to compare the patient satisfaction with automated translation compared with uh, working with an interpreter and a psychiatrist. <coughs> and finally, uh, to compare the diagnostic accuracy of those two methods. And I want to acknowledge the many team members at UC Davis that have been involved in this, uh, some of whose names are down at the bottom of this, uh, this slide. <coughs> so what are the learning objectives of this particular presentation? There are really three main ones. First of all, um, we've shown that automated transcription and translation of asynchronous telepsychiatry interviews is absolutely feasible and is something that can be done. Secondly, we uh, have really come to the conclusion that currently automated translation of language accuracy for simple words is sufficient for general medical interviews, but probably not for psychiatric interviews where more sophisticated language is often used. Uh, and finally, we, we have found very clearly that patients much prefer being interviewed in their own language without an interpreter. Um, but that interpreters are still more are, are themselves are actually more accurate when using video conferencing compared with in-person interviews. And we actually ended up this trial seeing about 30 patients uh, instead of in person using Zoom uh, as a result of the pandemic. And this was an interesting uh, incidental finding. So uh, the, for more context and background, we know that patients with limited English proficiency re receive substandard health care. There's a huge amount of information about that as uh, reflected by the previous speakers. And we also know that medical interpreters are often in short supply and also their quality is completely unknown and has really never actually been properly assessed. Um, uh, so uh, we saw automated translation of recorded interviews as being a possible solution. Now, this is what asynchronous telepsychiatry is. Essentially, the, uh, if you look at the, uh, we're comparing it with synchronous telepsychiatry, which is just basically video conferencing directly with the patient, wherever they happen to be. 
Uh, in asynchronous telepsychiatry, a provider refers a patient, um, the, a video of the patient uh, with an interviewer, who's typically a, a non-medical uh, interviewer, um, is recorded, and that is then sent to a psychiatrist, uh, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, um, who reviews that interview, looks at any other EMR data or any other data they've got about the patient, and literally writes a treatment plan and, and recommendations for the primary care physician uh, that the primary care physician can then uh, follow up. So this is a form of collaborative care that is really becoming the gold standard for much of mental health care nowadays. This is what we built, um, obviously without any faces being able to be seen, um, but we uh, built a nice sophisticated uh, app that allowed us to upload videos and also make diagnoses, write notes, um, and, uh, and send information uh, uh, to back to primary care physicians. Um, so we then started doing the studies. The first study we had to do was actually very basic, uh, just to look at uh, uh, trans language translation accuracy. We had to make decisions as to which uh, translation tools to use, and we had to use HIPAA compliance. Um, so that actually ruled out most of the translation tools. Um, and uh, in the end, uh, we really had to make choices between uh, Microsoft and Google. Um, and uh, so we, we used those particular uh, uh, companies' uh, uh, transcription and translation engines. Um, in this first study, uh, we actually didn't use patients uh, because we were looking at a fairly wide range of different uh, technologies and we, did, and we obviously had to keep to HIPAA. So we recorded uh, several uh, fictional interviews. Uh, they, these were uploaded to our app <clears throat> and we then went through a process of counting the errors uh, for both the transcription of Spanish into uh, Spanish language into Spanish writing, and then from Spanish writing into English writing. Um, uh, and obviously the translation component of that. And there are clear, me well-described methodologies in the, in the literature to look at how to uh, do, how to calculate word error rates and, and, uh, and, and the accuracy of the different transcripts. So uh, we went through with initially these uh, uh, fairly simple uh, language interviews. Um, this is the, the math. I won't go into great detail about this, but it's well worked out. And, and uh, we can calculate essentially the word error rate and the accuracy rate of the actual language transcription and then uh, translation. Now, what were the results of this? Um, if you look on the left-hand side here, um, these are just taken from two interviews. Um, uh, if you look at the interview one top left, um, you'll see here essentially that uh, the, uh, the low score, the word error rate, is a good score. That's, uh, that was uh, Google's beating Microsoft clearly on that one, uh, as, as they did also on interview two. So you can see the, the, the word error rate is 0.07 on, on interview two and 0.19 <clears throat> on interview one. And these are perfectly acceptable word error rates. Then you go to the second level of actually translating that transcripted language. Um, and here, a high score is good. Um, so here, the Google accuracy was 0.84 and then 0.95, these two particular interviews. Uh, and so this basically uh, said to us that, uh, that, that certainly Google was more accurate than the Microsoft version uh, and, and, and accurate enough um, to uh, meet the general industry standards, which were about a 10% error rate overall. Now, we then moved on to look at um, a much more difficult, uh, uh, I guess, uh, situation, which is the actual genuine psychiatric interview. Um, we, we, had a ran we designed a randomized controlled trial uh, where method A was our gold standard, the patient being seen uh, with an interpreter and a psychiatrist. Um, so the, uh, the patient speaking Spanish, the interpreter translating that for the psychiatrist. And method B, the experimental one, was, was where we recorded the patient uh, and then used an automated translation system. Um, uh, all patients were phone screened, gave verbal consent. Uh, we got patients referred from uh, primary care clinics uh, and, and paid them a small amount for their time uh, at a level that was thought to be non-coercive. Um, over about a three-year period, we saw 114 patients, 17 were screened to have mainly psychiatric disorders and 40 chronic medical disorders. And all of them came into our clinic for essentially a four-hour clinic visit 
where their interviews were randomly ordered. Uh, so method A versus method B first. They all had the uh, uh, research SCID, which is the psychiatric uh, gold standard for diagnose, diagnosing patients. Uh, considerable amounts of satisfaction data about each of the two methods, including make, having to make forced choice preferences between the two methods. And then we, we also gave all of the patients their notes so they could take them to their primary care physicians and follow up as necessary. Um, so, so this was a, a, a comprehensive uh, RCT. Um, we, we had a lot of uh, lessons learned from this. First of all, it was extremely difficult to actually recruit a lot of these patients. Um, uh, and we went through all sorts of different approaches and, 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 actually, and finally employed a, uh, a, a Spanish-speaking uh, research assistant who had a prior a background of working in, uh, in essentially in call centers and was very used to doing cold calls to patients. And she was actually very impressive and, and managed to recruit to much better than our, than our previous approaches. Um, we also found that uh, 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 not to our surprise, but this confirmed what we expected, that a lot of the patients had major trauma histories, which made them very sensitive to these uh, uh, consultations. And we actually ended up on several occasions with interpreters being in tears, hearing the stories that were coming out. Um, and, um, and then obviously COVID was a challenge, although it ultimately turned out to be helpful. And then finally, quite a few of the patients who said that they had medical problems actually also had psychiatric problems. So there was a lot of, uh, of, of extra morbidity. But, uh, again, we, we predicted, but we certainly saw. Now, we've actually published this, uh, the results I'm going, about to show you here in JMIR. Uh, so you can look that up if you just put my name into, into PubMed. Um, uh, and what we were doing here was examining the hard part of language, what's called figurative language devices. In other words, the use of metaphors and similes um, and idiomatic expressions uh, that come up in psychiatric interviews much more than in general medical interviews. And you can see here some examples of, uh, of that. So, uh, for instance, a metaphor, you can see that it's written in Spanish. The, current, the correct translation in English is this is overwhelmingly, but actually the literal translation in English uh, is uh, this is filling my brain. Um, so you can understand how with an automated system that, that's much more difficult for the automated system to translate correctly. Um, uh, another, uh, you, you, and you can see several other copies of these. And, and, and as I say, the slides are all going to be available, so you can you can look at more details of difficult language that is currently commonly used in psychiatric interviews by people to explain how they feel. Um, now, what did we find? Um, first of all, we found many more of the figurative language devices used per minute of an interview uh, with the uh, asynchronous. Uh, uh, telepsychiatry. Now, in other words, when patients were being interviewed in their own language, that's not surprising. But what it means is that we actually had much better levels of language, much more detailed language, uh, where we were interviewing patients in their own language and recording that interview. Um, and I think it's actually well described in the literature that patients themselves, when they're working with interpreters, often use a fairly sort of pidgin form of their own language, uh, uh, which uh, doesn't give the interpreter perhaps enough uh, of a feel for what's actually going on with them. But uh, so we certainly saw that. Um, we saw that uh, people spoke much more freely in their own language with uh, like when, when being video recorded, many more words per minute. Um, we actually found uh, that the, not surprisingly, that the interpreters actually accurate, more accurately translated these figurative language devices. Um, uh, so, you know, again, we weren't surprised by that. Um, and uh, and then if you actually did Zoom rather than uh, in person, the interpreters became even more accurate. And so actually we found that the interpreters provided a better level of interpretation uh, online than they did in person. Now, what about preferences? Well, interestingly, the patients actually overall preferred to have the interviews done in their own language um, by a non-psychiatrist and then with that being recorded. Um, 
So uh, having said that, there was a group of about half the patients had no overall preference. So certainly 75% of the patients were comfortable with being video recorded for this uh, interview. Uh, and about 25 to 30 percent would have would have preferred to have uh, a, uh, a a traditional synchronous interview directly. Um, so what are what are the implications here for cross language health interviews in the future? There's a lot. First of all, patients prefer being interviewed in their own language and give a much more detailed and more descriptive medical and psychiatric history. Um, secondly, the current gold standard is in-person interpreters or online interpreters. Um, but, and, and this should probably change to increasing the use of video interpretation uh, rather than in-person interpretation. Um, we found that uh, current transcription and translation systems are probably adequate for simple medical interviews, hence the, the first trial, but not yet for uh, ready for complicated psychiatric interviews where there are a lot of uh, figurative language devices used. Um, but obviously we know that automated language systems are constantly improving with machine learning. And, and I would bet that they will ultimately become the gold standard for interpreting done via asynchronous or synchronous methods. So, our conclusions from uh, the trial, going back to our learning objectives originally. First of all, asynchronous telepsychiatry and automated translation is absolutely feasible. Um, when using medical interpreters for long interviews, patients often speak in this pidgin language, and that's often encouraged by the interpreters, using less words and less complicated language than when speaking to a natural language speaker. And I think as clinicians, we all have to be very available of that fact. Um, thirdly, we found interpreters are more accurate on virtual consults than they are in person, which is absolutely fascinating, but uh, there was no question about that. Um, fourthly, in terms of the actual translation systems we use, we found Google Translate to be more accurate um, uh, and was probably sufficient for simple interviews. Now, this uh, study was, uh, the actual data collection was, was between sort of two and a half and four years ago. So these systems have greatly improved since then. Um, uh, we found that interpreters are, are slightly more accurate at uh, figurative language device uh, translation than the automated systems. And undoubtedly, patients uh, overall preferred the asynchronous consults in their own language with video recording uh, to using interpreters. So we have a lot more data to, to, to analyze and we're, and we're still part way through this data analysis. The study actually only officially finished about uh, five months ago. Um, and we look forward to more publications and more results. And I hope this has been of interest and, and look forward to any questions that you might have. So thank you, Dr. Yellowlees. And thank you again to all of our presenters for their very informative presentations. So this concludes the content portion of the webinar. Now we have a few minutes left for questions. You can type, type them into the Q&A section of the WebEx portal as depicted on this slide. Although we may not be able to get to them all today, we'll provide responses to all questions in writing. You'll receive an email once these responses are available. Now, as you're thinking about your questions to submit, I have a few starter questions for our panel. So let's start with Dr. Wallace. So, Andrea, you mentioned staff reluctance to screen. Can you talk more about strategies that health systems might use to help with this? Uh, excellent. So this is um, something we continue to work on with our own staff here at the University of Utah. I mean, there's a lot of more traditional sort of um, implementation approaches. One is giving feedback about, you know, what they've done. Um, you know, patients' stories have been pretty effective in terms of saying this screening that you took time to do actually resulted in this for the patient. So we're finding that that's, you know, well received in general. Um, but it, it, there's something to creating connections between the staff and those who are doing the outreach work um, on sort of a collective team. And a lot of health systems are really wrestling with this because these are a lot of new, um, new roles being created and really trying to understand, you know, kind of creating a, an esprit de corps, as it were, you know, sort of a 
um, a, a group that, that's really um, in it together. So we're trying to do more of that. Um, in addition to the general, you know, usual um, run charts and reporting back about sort of, you know, to their managers and things like that, really trying to engage them. But um, yeah, that's that's a bit of it. One more question for you, Andrea. Okay. Given that staff are pressed for time, have you looked into paring down the, the four top screening questions that determine the desire for follow-up? Yeah. So this is a, a really common question um, that um, a lot of health systems are really trying to wrestle with because, you know, we have limited time. Um, so it's like, how, how few questions can we ask before we can move on with this? Um, the challenge here is that what we're finding is that you have to ask a certain amount of questions to be able to allow patients to even understand what we're talking about. Because when we're talking about social needs, it's not just money. It's about um, social support, as I mentioned. It's um, about child, we ask about child care and elder care as part of our screening, which it can affect anyone. Transportation barriers can affect anyone for any number of reasons. So we're really trying to expand the conversation beyond just um, do you have money to pay for medications uh, or for food? It, it's more expansive than that. So we find that a sweet spot is those ten are those ten questions, um, and it, it does take only a minute. So but the, everyone is trying to pare it down. Right. Yeah. Understood. <laughs> Um, now, a couple of questions have come in for, um, for Dr. Jack. So, so, Brian, do you think large language models like ChatGPT have a potential role for conversational agents? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And thanks, thanks for ever uh, asking that question. It's a good one. Yeah, you know, I think that um, you know, things are moving so quickly in all these areas, and the sky is the limit. And I think the answer is, the short answer is yes. And I think that the, you know, the opportunity to use um, all these systems, you know, within the structures of, you know, clinical medicine is really profound. You know, in you know, integration into EMRs, integration into um, patient portals, um, and and you know, also in terms of directly, um, you know, assisting clinicians in delivering, you know, clinical content. So in the situation of Gabby, for example, um, you know, it could be that that Gabby could do the risk assessment and begin the conversation at home. Um, or, or, or maybe even to start with, the, the clinician could just prescribe Gabby uh, for a patient and not, not take all the time necessary to do the risk assessment while in the office visit. The patient could go home, meet Gabby, do the risk assessment, begin the conversation, and print out the My Health To-Do List, which is the list of risks that they have, uh, and then uh, begin conversations with Gabby about each of those risks, and then come back talk with a clinician about, you know, what do you, this is what Gabby has told me, what do you think about these sorts of things? Um, so, so it can be in conjunction with, um, with clinical care. It could also be, I think, as this question is getting at, is that, you know, could it be incorporated into, you know, patient portals or some other um, population health tools that big health systems um, are using increasingly? And we believe that our data actually shows that if if a, if a large health system identified um, women between 18 and 35 uh, in the target user group that we have identified that it's successful with and delivered you know Gabby as a tool to everyone in their health system to use Gabby at home by yourself um, that over time that health risks will be identified and addressed and the, and the population as a whole will get healthier healthier um, if that's, you know, I think, I think our data supports that. And if, if um, not, it's, it, things are moving in that direction. A another possibility is, you know, embedding conversational agents or chat box technologies, a variety of different technologies now into patient portals um, where, for example, to, to talk about, you know, the shared decision making uh, around, um, you know, preventive health services around colonoscopies and PSAs and mammograms and, and cervical cancer screening, um, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to save the clinicians uh, time, which is also becoming a very important you know, outcome variable for all these systems as, as the health workforce challenges are becoming more profound. So I think, uh, I think the answer is yes to the question. And there's lots of exciting ways in the future about how exactly that's going to happen. Thank you. More, more research for ARC to fund, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, and thanks to ARC for doing it. Yes. So we also had a, a follow-on question about your presentation, Brian. Have you explored post-birth interventions? The, the asker of this question says, 
that this person's understanding is that two thirds of the deaths are preventable and related to hemorrhage and blood loss. Yeah, yeah, it's also a very good question. You know, it, it's just that um, you know life is short and the art is long. You know, and that the that these kinds of applications can be um, used in a whole variety of different clinical situations. And a lot of people have asked about antenatal care and about postpartum care, et cetera. Uh, our, our, our way of you know, starting is, is with a primary prevention approach relative to preconception care, just because that's where we started, because it was an interest of mine. Um, you know, but moving forward, you know, it can be used in a whole variety of different ways. I do think that for, for HIT-type systems, um, you know, where, where is it that we start? And I think that there's a couple of criteria. One is it ought to be a really important problem. Um, and, and, certainly, and certainly maternal mortality among African-American women and low birth weight and infant mortality are really big problems. Uh, and if we can address some of our issues with those things, it would be uh, worthwhile. The second is, is it ought to be something that's evidence-based. Um, and that currently that evidence is not being applied in clinical practice. And preconception care does fit that criteria in the sense that there's, it's not really clinical care because it's too big. You know, the, the, who is going to screen for 100 different things and talk about social determinants and about health promotion activities and to the extent that Gabby does in clinical practice? It, it just doesn't happen. Uh, and it's not really public health either. So it's something in between that we think that information technology, you know, really can be applied in those areas um, to to improve health, but not be clinical medicine or public health. Um, and and then it ought to be something that people like and, and will want to use. Um, because, it, you know, there's the world is full of RCTs that show um, efficacy, but, but for a variety of reasons, people don't use that intervention uh, in terms of effectiveness. So that, that's where the action is now in terms of you know, efficiency and effectiveness of systems in term, terms of getting people to use things that are evidence-based at this point. So yeah, we'd love to do, we'd love to do a postpartum trial, but it takes years. And so I think, you know, as we develop, um, you know, how to do these things better, it can be more quickly uh, applied to other clinical circumstances. Great point about uh, usability and the desire to use. Um, thank you. So a couple of questions for, for you, Dr. Yellowlees. Um, I was, first of all, interested in, in your idea that, that video um, may be the gold standard as opposed to in-person interviews. So, so can you talk a bit, Peter, about what it would take to get there? <laughs> What's the, the glide path to, to get video to be the gold standard? Yeah, I think it's something that uh, really hit us during this study. Um, and um, what, what we noticed, you know, anecdotally was that there was much better eye contact on video than there was sitting in a semicircle where you had the patient, the interpreter and the psychiatrist, you know, as a threesome um, on, uh, and, and everybody looking sort of left and right as they were talking and listening to each other. Um, and on video, obviously, you get to see everybody. Um, if you have a gallery view. And so I think that the interpreters actually got a better look at what the patient was saying. Um, and, uh, and perhaps also the, the patients were um, maybe a little bit less anxious. Um, you know, the distance involved in video makes discussing uh, difficult subjects actually easier. Many of these patients were highly traumatized, had really horrendous uh, backgrounds uh, with, with abuses. Um, and uh, so the patients themselves may have spoken more easily on video than they did in person, um, but then the interpreters were actually getting better eye contact with them, as was the um, uh, when uh, as was the psychiatrist when we were using Zoom for those interviews. Um, so I think you know, but it's something that needs to be explored. Quite honestly, I mean, you know, uh, are in, uh, should we in fact be using? Uh, you know, the Zoom equivalents of the world as the gold standard in future for, for these uh, interviews. I think for many people that's the case. I, um, it may not be the case for short sort of, you know, more screening style medical interviews, but certainly for longer, um, more in-depth uh, interviews like we were doing, um, I think that's the case. Thank you. And, and Peter, in general, what recommendations might you have for researchers attending this presentation uh, conducting cross-language studies? Sure. Um, and there's also another really good question in, in, the, in the Q&A that I'll address about uh, using uh, promoteras. 
Um, the um, so so um, so the sort of I'm sorry, but your your question was about the. the just in, in general, uh, recommendations for researchers conducting sure. cross-language studies. Sure, sure. I think, first of all, it's difficult. <laughs> um, it, uh, I mean, it really is, and Ark knows this very well. Uh, you have to actually have a lot more money, quite honestly, um, uh, because you've got to translate everything. Uh, you've got to have everything available in, you know, at least two languages, sometimes more. Um, it's, there's a much smaller pool of potential people to employ, to work. Uh, on these sorts of projects, um, uh, and uh, and it's uh, it, it's often harder to um, recruit the patients, as I mentioned. I mean, the other big problem we obviously had is that you know it, it, the patients uh, who are undocumented, uh, who who frequent many of the clinics we were going to, um, are uh, much less likely to agree uh, a to be in a sort of quote government study, and b to be video recorded. Um, and you can understand that. Um, uh, so I think, you know, that w whenever anybody's doing work in this area, you really have to make sure that you have uh, really thought through carefully how you're going to do your recruiting. Um, and, uh, and also you need, uh, you know, quite honestly, you know, 20% plus budget compared with a normal non-cross language uh, uh, study, and I think that's something that ARC has to think about because that certainly wasn't the case in our study. We we, we had to fund a fair amount of this, you know, through extra time ourselves. Um, we, you know, we wouldn't have been able to to see the number of patients. I think with with the funding we had, uh, and we actually added on extra patients at the end beyond what we originally planned to because of the fascination of the Zoom uh, findings that we had. Um, so, uh, so I think that's one one thing. The second, from a research point of view, the obvious people to be doing these interviews across language are promoteras. So, in other words, support uh, people from within the individuals' communities. Um, and I would have, uh, we actually put in a grant uh, to NIH uh, to do exactly that as a follow up from this particular grant. We negotiated with groups of promoteras in the Central Valley. They were really fascinated because this was a really interesting way of expanding their role um, and, uh, and having them, you know, help uh, their communities more effectively by, by becoming trained uh, mental health interviewers. We're, you know, we weren't asking them to try and diagnose anybody or anything, but we did want them to interview patients and then send the interviews to us. Unfortunately, that wasn't funded. Um, so, you know, there's a study there waiting to be done by anybody listening uh, that I think would be a significant improvement on what we did. Thank you. So you touched on this question uh, that's in the Q&A here about any work on using community health workers to help out with communication. And that can apply to our other presenters too. So uh, Brian and Andrea, if you'd like to tackle that as well, feel free. And say, um, community health workers have been really at the forefront of a lot of the social needs outreach for sure. Um, and so there's any number of models about how to uh, integrate them into clinical care as well as outreach efforts. So um, we, we have not done as much of that, but I know like 2101, our, our partner in this work has worked with um, our, our community health or, uh, worker organization at the state level. So I don't know if that's a, a solid answer, but yes, um, there's a lot, lot of um, different models being explored about how to do this. It's, it's always the reimbursement question that's always the elephant in the room about it. And so that's, that's I think, the, one of the biggest hurdles we need to work on. Good point about reimbursement. Brian, any, any thoughts from, from your end about community health worker input? Yeah, so yeah, the, um, yeah our, our work in Lesotho in Southern Africa, so it's a, a poor rural mountainous country where community health workers are really a fundamental part of the health system, uh, that each, each village has a community health worker that's um, connected to the Ministry of Health in some way or another. And then in our in our trial, so it's it's remarkable. Despite the, the ruralness and the poverty of the country, uh, young people between 18 and 35 have a high penetrance of mobile phones, and it's and it's growing. And, and not only mobile phones, but smartphones. Uh, so it just tells you what's happening in terms of you know the opportunities that that um, that mobile technologies, mobile health education uh, provides for people um, around the world, but. Um, and, and will be increasing over time, certainly. 
but the community health workers uh, would connect with the women who have and who enrolled in the um, in the in the Gabi, which is called Entabi um, in Lesotho and Sesotho language. Um, the 135 that we had recruited to use it for four to six weeks. But the the woman would show the community health workers in the village. So the community health workers would tell us that they're learning a lot by listening to what Entabi has to say about various clinical topics and suggestions about what to do for various clinical problems, uh, which are pretty profound in the country in terms of HIV rates and TB and a variety of different other um, morbidities that face the country. So, um, so yeah, so involvement of, of village health workers in, um, in health education systems is um, something we can learn a lot from from other places as well. Thank you. And Peter, a question came in for you. Can you please discuss the regulatory barriers to implementation of telepsychology or telepsychiatry? Sure. How long have you got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, no, no. Seriously, I mean, look. Uh, you know, one of the good things about the pandemic has been that the regulatory barriers have been dramatically reduced, and that's why you know, uh, huge. There's been a huge expansion of telepsychiatry, telepsychology generally. Um, uh, and um, you know, the good news is that quite a few of these barriers are staying down um, once the public health emergency finishes on uh, May the eleventh. Um, so that, you know, we'll still be able to see, uh, do mental health consultations um, uh, within states, some, and, uh, with some states potentially across state lines uh, in a way that just wasn't possible before. Um, and uh, the uh, DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency, actually just put out some guidelines literally three days ago, um, uh, actually making it easier to prescribe controlled substances in, on a continuing basis, uh, again, for people with addictions and, and children with ADHD primarily. Um, so, uh, uh, but, you know, there's always, uh, you know, regulations are there for a reason and, um, and, and over time, you know, things change. And, and I think um, it was no doubt it's much easier now than it used to be um, the, the key issue that you have to always be very careful of um, is, uh, is, is HIPAA and making sure that you maintain, um, you know, appropriate security and privacy um, and that anybody and, and, you know, any system that you're using, you need to have what's called a business associates agreement with the manufacturer. Um, and uh, that, that essentially says that you can use their video system and you can see the patients on that. Uh, but that they can't look in and see what you're doing, which is the key thing. So it's essentially looking through a pipe and you can see the face at the other end, but the people can't look from outside the pipe. Um, and, and that's not going away and it shouldn't go away. So I think there are good regulations and then there are regulations that are set up, uh, you know, for historical reasons that uh, really you know, need to be uh, uh, cut down occasionally. So we have a question here that's, that's very broad. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and, and narrow it down a bit. So the, the question is, how can technology adoption make healthcare more efficient, safe, and accurate? So what, what I'm going to narrow that down to is, you know, this webinar topic was about technology to help the underserved. So, so if you had to, if you could wave a magic wand and conduct your favorite uh, piece of research to help the underserved, what would that be? Uh, for me, it's very simple. I would make sure that all of the underserved had both uh, smartphones and access to bandwidth. Uh, many of them, many people who are underserved do actually have smartphones, but they 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 have to go and literally sit outside Starbucks to to use them. Um, uh, and so bandwidth is a huge issue. Um, and I think we can deliver an enormous amounts of care through mobile technologies. Um, uh, and uh, and that you know the the underserved from many different areas and many different groups are clearly the most needy group, um, and this is an enormous opportunity that we we could uh, you know easily uh, easily work on. Um, and uh, I mean the pandemic essentially demonstrated that you know there was yet another digital divide here, um, where uh, in fact people who were homeless or living in 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 in, in difficult circumstances, particularly in metropolitan areas, were, were actually the most difficult people to reach for care. 
Uh, whereas in the past, it always used to be sort of people living in, in, in rural areas in the middle of nowhere. Um, suddenly, it's become actually a metropolitan type issue. And I think uh, I think it's it's there are solutions for that. But uh, we've got to look at, um, you know, how best we deliver care using phones. And I think phones are clearly, you know, mobile care is the way healthcare is going. We have to really focus strongly on all sorts of mobile care, both synchronous and asynchronous across many different disciplines. Um, because if nothing else, a, a, it's there and B, the younger generations expect it. Thank you. Jeff, Andrea, um, go ahead. Now I'm going to say I want to emphasize that point because again, we have you know between seven and ten percent of our patients who don't have access to reliable um, even telephone technology, and I have no idea. You know, we're trying to explore what to do um, with those patients and, and understand their outcomes. Um, I think in addition to that, though, continuing to um, push the conversation back to the consumer and patient needs here. And, and that's what this is about. I mean, there's just a, there's just so many options for technology at the consumer level, but oftentimes we continue designing interventions around what we can do in our EHRs. Um, so I think that it's, it's going to be a dance over the next, uh, certainly the next 10 years, but definitely over the next uh, probably three to five um, that are really going to, to push our regulate, regulatory um, uh, barriers and, and data exchange barriers to really try to make it patient-centered. Um, so that's what I would like to say. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, yeah maybe I can add, Chris, that, um, that there was comments in the chat about, um, you know, the, the lack of difference between among socioeconomic groups relative to birth outcomes for African-American and Black women, which is absolutely true. It's been known for some time now. Um, and that, you know, I think that the, you know, the, the, our approach to you know, to health literacy in systems like Gabby is to um, is to apply an intervention that is appropriate for all health literacy levels and all socioeconomic levels. And so the Gabby we think is appropriate for you know both low health literacy as well as um, those with higher levels of health literacy, um, and, and so appropriate for for all African American women as best as we can do at the moment. Um, in terms of you know, like you know identifying you know is is it a matter of you know the primary prevention approach is a matter of um, you know are we are we a, a, you know focusing on African American women because there are more risk factors among African American women and that that is not true necessarily there are some risk factors like um, like weight and obesity and hypertension that are greater in the African American community but across the board are generally less um, so it's really a matter of access to care and availability of care in terms of getting information that we think will make a difference to everybody so it's so it's a little bit in terms of the question because about what 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 um study would i do um around you know hit and disparities uh is to continue this research would be you know to connect the dots from a process measure which is really the trans theoretical model changes moving to action and maintenance for each individual risk factors across the board to do a large study um to show that the birth outcomes like low birth weight or uh, infant mortality, um, you know, could really be impacted, which I think it will if we could do a study that is large enough uh, to show that difference. And that would be a really big deal, and that needs to be done. So there needs to be more funding um, in in disparity interventions um, across the board, in my view. Thanks, Brian. So I think there, um, well, actually, there's one final question here that I'll take. What role can policymakers play in promoting the adoption and effective use of digital health technologies among underserved populations? It's open to all the panelists. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I think I think going back again to this um, to the population health approach, you know, so to, to put the burden not on individuals to go after various technologies that will improve their health, but put the burden on health systems to both decrease disparities and improve health across the population um, and to, you know, to, to, have, to have incentives, um, you know, financial incentives for health systems to make uh, evidence-based uh, interventions that impact disparities available to everyone within their health system um, would, I think, go a long way towards making these things available uh, for people. Um, and to think about how how that could be done 
um, would be really interesting uh, to do. So a population health approach for something like Gabby and other things that will be developed you know, over time to make it available um, for, um, for all women and men and, and families uh, to be able to use it would be good. So my suggestion is that policymakers need to listen to young people much more than they currently do. Most policymakers are from my generation. Uh, and in reality, we are not the best people to be making policy. We may have the experience, but uh, we don't necessarily have the, the attitudes. And so if you look at uh, telemedicine as an example, the, the, the reason, or a major reason why telemedicine has not developed much prior to the pandemic is because providers were not very keen on it and didn't want to change they were, the way they worked. Whereas we know that patients have wanted to use these systems for years and years and years. Um, and so I think we've got to you know, talk to patients and talk to younger people um, because this is how they live. Um, and we are still providing a lot of very old fashioned healthcare. And we're paying for it in a very old fashioned way. <laughs> so that's no, Andrea, yeah. <laughs> you have the last word here, Andrea. So. <laughs> no, I mean, I, and I, no, I, I think that that's, you know, there are reasons that we're, we're continuing to deliver care the way we are is because, you know, our, again, our payment models aren't necessarily keeping up with um, the technology. And so I think there's opportunities here um, to make sure that, that we keep pace. You know, there's certainly the provider level barriers, but then also, you know, the, the real, the real um, underpinning is a lot of times our, our ability to make it sustainable. So. Hey, well, that's the last word. So <laughs> can we bring up the last slide, please, Amal? So first of all, I, I want to thank our terrific panelists and also the audience for all these terrific questions. This was a, a great webinar. I had a lot of fun. So we've reached the end of our time, unfortunately. Uh, for those interested in obtaining continuing education credit for participating in this webinar, please visit the URL shown on this slide. You will select today's webinar, which will be indicated by date and title, to claim your credits. You'll have 14 days to claim your continuing education credits. Upon exiting today's webinar, ARC is also fielding a brief evaluation, and we hope that you'll complete this survey to share your feedback with us. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the afternoon. <laughs>